okay. They, we, um, slowly everybody is coming on board. So we will give it a minute for everybody to uh, log on. Good evening, everybody. Uh, we are just going to give it another minute to give people a chance to actually um, come uh, on board. So, um, so just be patient with us. Okay, um, it is seven o'clock, uh, so uh, we should get started. Um, thank you everybody for coming tonight uh, for this wonderful uh, educational program that we will present to you. Uh, my name is Megan Avalon and I'm health officer for the Westfield Regional Health Department. Uh, and I'm so happy uh, to present, uh, to introduce our presenters that we have with us this evening. Uh, first, we have Dr. Janice Baker with us. Uh, Dr. Janice Baker has been an associate director with Overlook and Chatham Family Medicine for over 20 years. And she is a faculty member of the Overlook Family Medicine Residency Program. She received her BA from Stanford University and her MD from Chicago Medical School. She is a board certified not only in family medicine, but also in hospice and palliative medicine. As a family practitioner, she is a strong advocate of all preventative care and for immunizations in particular. She maintains her practice in Chatham, New Jersey. Then next we have Dr. Brittany Alexander. Dr. Alexander is a second year family medicine resident at Overlook Medical Center. She received her undergraduate degree at the University of Notre Dame and went to medical school at Toro College of Osteopathic Medicine. Then we have Dr. Ellen Shelley. Dr. Shelley holds a doctorate degree in nursing, a master's in field epidemiology and nursing administration. A graduate of Seton Hall University, UNC Chapel Hill, and Rutgers University. Over 30 years, uh, with over 30 years nursing experience, board certified in nursing administration, healthcare quality, case management, ambulatory healthcare, and she's also a licensed health officer in New Jersey. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Denise Rizzolo. Dr. Rizzolo has been practicing, has been a practicing physician assistant in family practice for the past 20 years. She also has a PhD in family science. She works with the Westfield Regional Health Department in our vulnerable population program. And she is the practicum coordinator for the Fairleigh Dickinson University Master of Public Health program. So welcome. Thank you all for agreeing to present tonight. Um, for the public, just some um, ground rules um, or some um, thoughts. Uh, so to have tonight uh, be really organized and flow um, in, a, in a good manner, um, what we were thinking is we are going to present a, a little bit um, some topics um, that were on the flyer, and then we are going to open it up uh, for questions and answers. Uh, we are going to stop around 8 p.m., but if any questions remain, we will certainly get back to you. We'll post all the questions and answers on all the websites, uh, but we definitely want tonight to be interactive. So I am uh, really uh, looking forward um, to tonight. Um, what we can do is uh, when it gets time for questions and answers, we can either type them in the chat um, or um, if you're able to raise a hand, uh, you can raise a hand um, as well. But we also have a bunch of questions we will address that were submitted ahead of time. So I am going to share my screen so we can start. And uh, today we will start uh, with Dr. Ellen Shelley. Um, okay, can, I, can you guys see the screen? Yes. Okay, yes. so 
Dr. Shelley, we are going to start um, with uh, talking about um, vaccination appointments. Sure. Welcome everyone and, and uh, thank you for having us. Um, the, the best way to find an appointment is to visit the covid19.nj.gov um, site and register there. They'll ask you a series of questions and um, once you've submitted, you should get an email back saying, thank you, we've received your registration. Um, at that point in time, what that means is, is that you're registered. Um, you should continue to watch your email because you'll receive another email telling you that it's time for you to log back on and to pick a site to schedule your appointment. Um, you should know that you should check your junk mail because sometimes the email will come through that way, but check the email frequently um, to make sure that you don't miss the email. The other way that you can um, get an appointment is through the Union County hotline. Um, if someone is not technically savvy or doesn't have access to a computer and internet, they can call the Union County hotline if you're a resident of Union County and you're over the age of 65. And they have someone that is live from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday who will um, take your information and register you to um, get a vaccine. There are other ways that you can register. Um, there are six mega sites in, in the state. Uh, there's one in Morris County, there's one in Gloucester County, um, there's one in Middlesex. Uh, they refer to them as the mega sites. And if you go directly to them, you can register there as well. Um, and the recommendation would be that you would want to register on as many sites as you can because uh, they may not reach you at one site as quickly as they can reach you, your name at another site. So I would recommend that you try and register at as many sites as possible. Um, the other thing that the State Health Department just recently um, introduced was they really want to vaccinate the age 75 years and older and they've set up a specific hotline for people if you're age 75 or older to call um, and try and make an appointment through that state senior vaccination hotline. And that number is up on the screen. It's 856-249-7007. Um, so if you sign up at, in as many places as you can that are within driving distance to you or where you think you can go. It'll give you more of an opportunity to um, get the vaccine um, as soon as you can. Um, and once you get an appointment and you're, you're satisfied, that's the site you wanna go to. If you have other appointments scheduled at other sites, um, then you can just call or log on and cancel those appointments. Thank you, Dr. Shelley. You're welcome. Uh, next, we have Dr. Rizzolo, who's going to talk a little bit about the contact tracing um, process and the COVID Alert uh, New Jersey app. Uh, Dr. Rizzolo, before we get started with your slides, um, you know, we've been getting a lot of questions at the health department that um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of COVID activity or illness. Um, do you think that's true? No, I would say um, it's it certainly as not um, at the rate that we saw last year, but we are still seeing um, an abundance of cases, not only, you know, I'm still in clinical practice, so I'm seeing them not only in practice, but I'm seeing them at the health office as well. Uh, so while we see less cases than we did, we are still seeing a significant, significant number of cases, 
which is why the contact tracing is still fairly important. Um, so please, when we call, answer the phone. Um, we're calling for a reason. We know that you may be contacting your contacts and we understand this, but they also need to speak to us because sometimes what gets confused is the difference between isolation and quarantine. So when we speak to them, we really can give them an understanding of what those two terms mean. All this information is confidential. We do not share it with anyone. We do not ask about legal status and we certainly don't, you know, there's concern, are we gonna to report to the police? And that's certainly not the case and that's never happened and never will. Um, we're only really going to ask you questions about, you know, who you've been in contact with, and this will help us with the contact tracing process. And um, contact tracing, even though we're going to talk about the vaccines and how effective they are and, and what a great rollout is going on, it really still helps us identify people who are not vaccinated and who can be exposed and who are at risk of getting this virus. Um, so next slide, Megan. Sure. We do have the... Uh, the New Jersey Alert application. So it's called COVID Alert New Jersey and it is completely free. So if you have an iPhone, you can get it at the app store for iPhone users. And for Android users, I looked it up and you can go to Google Play. And it works off of our Bluetooth technology that we all have and it senses any close contacts um, that have the app and it will exchange a, a secure random number. So it kind of talks app to app. It's not talking person to person. So we wanna make that clear that it's, it's, this is all pretty confidential and it's, it's done through this Bluetooth technology. Um, your name and location are never disclosed. I know that's a concern. Well, can they find me or can they geomap me? That, that's not what this app is doing. Um, this is purely for contact tracing. And as we said, all the users will remain anonymous. So no one's gonna know your name and we're not gonna be telling anyone your name as well. Next slide, Mike. So um, if you test positive for COVID-19, a contact tracer will call you and ask if you're willing to anonymously notify the close contacts. Um, your phone has detected by uploading your app's close contact list. So that's the way it will work through kind of the list and through this number. And each day the app will compare your list of close contacts codes with codes that are associated with the COVID-19 people. So once again, this is secure going app to app. And if there's a match, then they'll contact you and they'll let you know the next steps. So I, it's well worth having. We're still seeing cases. And while you know we, we fully believe that people will call each other, this is another great way for us to do a lot of contact tracing as well. So once again, it's free, it's secure, and it's anonymous. I mean, those are key words to remember that when we call you and we ask you, you know, do you, will you please sign up for this app? Be aware that, that everything is secure. Thank you so much for that. That was really, really great information. Um, so we are just going to switch slides here. Okay, and next we have Dr. Alexander, who's gonna to talk to us a little bit about the way uh, COVID-19 vaccines work. Okay, hi everybody. Um, so this is what a the coronavirus looks like. Um, this, if you can see, it has these things we call spikes on the outside. And this is really what both the Johnson & Johnson and Moderna and Pfizer vaccines are going to target. Albeit they do it in different ways, but being that it's unique to coronavirus, it's something that um, is really good for uh, vaccine purposes. Um, go to the next slide. So first I'll talk about Moderna and Pfizer. Um, so they basically, I'm sure you've been hearing their mRNA vaccines. And so I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about what that means and how basically your immune system responds to this type of vaccine. So mRNA is genetic material that all of our cells use to make uh, proteins and enzymes, everything in the body basically. Um, so what Moderna and Pfizer did is they took mRNA that codes for those spike proteins that I showed you before from the coronavirus. And since it's very fragile and that naturally, if we just kind of put the mRNA in our body, it would degrade on its own. They put it in a lipid particle, a lipid membrane. Um, and that's why it has all these special storage 
temperatures that you've been hearing about, but that's so we can get it into the body and get it into your cells without the cells breaking down, the body breaking down the mRNA. So you go to the next slide. So I'll show you a little bit about how this process works in the body. Go to the next, oh, is it there? Sorry. Um, oh no, sorry, back one. Um, mine's delayed a little bit. Sorry about that. Backwards. <laughs> don't know how to get back. Oh. Hold on a second. Okay, that's okay. We're just gonna go through. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. That one right there, perfect. Um, okay, so this is a lot of immunology. So I'm gonna try to give you the overview of it. I can it. Mm -hmm. So how it works, so those purple things on the top, that's the vaccine particle, that's the mRNA with the code for the coronavirus spikes. Sends in there, it comes in contact with your cells. It fuses with the membrane. It takes in that lipid particle, goes, lipid membrane goes away and the cells take in that mRNA. So basically the picture is showing the process of how the cell translates mRNA into those spike proteins. All of this is done outside your cell's nucleus. So I know there's concern that because you're introducing new DNA or RNA into your body that it'll alter your genetic makeup. And that's not happening at all. Um, it doesn't come in contact with your cell's DNA whatsoever. So it'll translate and make spikes and it'll present these spikes on the outside of your cells. And then it waits to be recognized by your immune system. So if you go to the next slide. So this is done in a few ways, but the first way is by these helper T cells. So when your cells, when a vaccinated cell dies, it'll release these proteins out into the, out into your body and it'll be picked up by helper T cells. Um, the T cells present it to B cells, which you can see on the other side, and the B cells are what produces antibodies. And that's what we're really looking for. And then these antibodies are encoded and they have this message in there and they're looking for that spike protein. So when a coronavirus, like when the coronavirus comes in and it has that specific spike protein, these antibodies are already programmed to attack the virus and attack those spike proteins. And that's how antibodies work. Um, the antibodies, the B cells can also recognize the vaccinated cells before it dies and recognize the spike proteins that it um, displays on the outside as well. And then the, I just wanted to show you the, so the next slide is just the antibodies attacking the coronavirus. Sorry, like I talked about. So this is what happens. They, this is the virus I showed in the beginning, comes in, those spike proteins in the body, it sets off the red, the signals in the body. And the antibodies are already primed and ready to attack it and they know what they're looking for. And then the last, there's a one more cell in your body, if we go to the next slide, that can be activated by these antigen presenting cells and those are called killer T cells. And they do exactly what their name says. They kill viruses. So just multiple ways the vaccine works, by you know, triggering your immune system to initiate three different cells in your body to fight specifically the coronavirus because the mRNA has programmed them to know what they're looking for. And like I said before, it, doesn't end, it does not alter your DNA at all. Once that mRNA is translated and processed, it gets degraded in your body. So it disappears because like I said before, that's the natural body's response. It's kind, it's very fragile. Um, so mRNA gets broken down as soon as it's red. Uh, anyway, so it doesn't hang around. Um, and then the next, I just want to touch base, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is a little different. So this does use DNA, um, but, and it's been put into an adenovirus. Um, so the adenovirus is a, it's actually been used, this model has been used in a lot of other vaccines, most notably the Ebola virus vaccine. Um, and they're working on it for a couple of more. Um, but the, an adenovirus is a virus that causes the common cold, but it's been altered in this case to not give you any symptoms. It's just a way to enter the cells in your body. So it, it's a, your body notices it as a intruder and it will, it's a way to get the DNA engulfed into your body's cells, if that makes sense. Um, and then the DNA is also once again, coded to make these spike proteins that I showed before. Um, and, it, and you can go to the next slide. This is the process is a little different. Um, 
So like I said, that adenovirus, which has been modified to not cause any harm to your body, no cold Mm -hmm. symptoms, just to get into that cell. So it goes in and the DNA escapes inside this cell. And this is how your body normally would process a cold virus. Um, And this does go into your nucleus and the DNA again, just has been modified to not affect your DNA. So it just is DNA coded for mRNA coded for the spike protein. So once this happens, it goes back to those slides I talked about before, and then it gets broken down as soon as it's done, as soon as the process is with making the spike proteins is done. I know that was a little confusing, but I just wanted to show you that these uh, antibodies, these vaccines, excuse me, are producing antibodies. They're producing T cells to help trigger antibodies and killer T cells to help fight coronavirus. So there's multiple ways it's trying to, it'll help stop the virus once you get it. And it's not affecting your DNA or your natural DNA in your cells whatsoever. So just two big points, but that's, so that's my immunology lesson for today. You guys brought me back to med school. So thank you. (laughs) I got a, I got a refresher. Um, And then the next thing I wanted to talk about is the contraindications to these vaccines. And surprisingly, there's not many at all. Um, The big contraindications are an allergic reaction to any component of the vaccine. And um, the, the part that people might have had a problem with in the past is poly polysorbate or PEG, which are sometimes found in laxatives. Um, but, and so if you had a reaction to a laxative, you might want to check which one that is, but the, there's really not much contraindication and the contraindication to Pfizer and Moderna, if you have one dose and you get a weak hypersensitivity reaction and an immediate one, which means swelling, trouble breathing, Um, and or hives that break out in your body within four hours, that would be a contraindication to receiving the second dose of Moderna or Pfizer. Um, But it's actually only a precaution to getting the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. So um, what that means is if you did have an allergic reaction to one of the Moderna or Pfizer ones, you could still get Johnson and Johnson. You just would have to be monitored for 30 minutes and do it in a facility that has medical attention if you need it. Um, And so really there's no other preclusion or contraindications to these vaccines um, other than an allergic reaction to any component in the past. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Alexander. That technology for the vaccines is truly fascinating. It is. And they've worked on the adenovirus one. It's been in multiple vaccines in the past. And the mRNA has actually had a lot of research done on it um, for multiple other vaccines. This is the first one we've produced. Um, But, you know, it was tested by the FDA vigorously and uh, it had a lot of funding behind it. And uh, they are working on other vaccines with it. So it's been tested and, and in the making for like probably 10 plus probably right. more than that. Um, it's just never been put out yet, but it's been tested for 10 plus years in labs. And these vaccines were tested on animals and then went through the FDA, the whole rigorous process of trials, four phase human trials and things like that. And so it's, and the anaphylaxis reaction, actually I read was only about seven or 4.7 per million for Moderna and 2.5 per million people for Johnson and Johnson. So very, very low. Wow, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. No problem. So next we have Dr. Baker, who is going to talk a little bit more about the vaccines. I am just going to share my screen again. Okay, and here we go. Okay, so Dr. Baker, the floor is all yours. All right, terrific. Thank you so much for having both of us. It's, uh, It's nice to be here. So I'm gonna be talking about a couple of things. The first thing I'm gonna start about is um, the efficacy because we have these wonderful virus um, vaccines. And so how well do they work? Next slide. So all three vaccines are unbelievably effective, um, much more effective than almost any other vaccine that we really are working with, including the flu vaccine and mumps vaccines. Um, These COVID vaccines came back, uh uh-oh, Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, 
with the trials unbelievably effective. So as you can see, the Pfizer vaccine is 95% effective in preventing symptomatic COVID infections after two doses, which like I said, is really astonishing. Um, this appears to be basically um, equally effective across age groups as well as um, racial and ethnic groups. Moderna is almost virtually the same at 94.1% effective in preventing symptomatic COVID-19 infections. Um, apparently it's minimally less effective in people less than 65, but like minimally, not enough to even really mention it, but I figured since I was doing the research. Um, and it also is roughly equal across um, racial and ethnic groups. And the studies, these studies, I mean, this is important to know, these studies were done prior to the emergence of the new variants from the UK, Brazil, and South, um, these South Americas. Next slide. Um, Johnson & Johnson is a one-dose vaccine, which is 72% effective against moderate and severe disease in the US, um, a bit less in other places in the world. And one's first reaction is like, oh, 72%, that's not so good. It's unbelievable. Um, like I said, it's much, much higher than almost any of the other vaccines that we have, which have basically brought down the incidence of many lethal diseases across the world to nothing. So 72% is extremely effective. And it's important to know that the it was tested approximately three weeks after one dose. So the reason that Johnson & Johnson decided to go ahead with just one dose is because they initially were doing animal studies and they noticed extremely high antibody levels after one dose. So rather than doing the two dose system that Moderna and Pfizer did, they decided to do their testing with one to see if we could get increased efficacy for reasons that would be really, really helpful worldwide. Because if one dose of a vaccine was able to be effective, this would be much easier to produce and to vaccinate more people, because as you know, I mean, it's great if everybody in our country, our county country, is vaccinated, but this um, pandemic is not going to really be under control until 85% of the world has either had the virus or has been vaccinated. The other important thing to know is that, um, that Johnson & Johnson is 85% effective against severe disease with no difference across eight countries or three regions, and key, there were no hospitalizations or deaths in the vaccine trial um, 28 days following vaccination with the J&J &J vaccine. So that's really the key. I, I'm sure we all know people that have had COVID, they were sick, they didn't feel very good for a little while, and then they were fine. That's about 80 to 90%. But there's lots of people that, as Dr. Alexander and I had seen, have been hospitalized and haven't pa have passed away because of this horrible virus. So to be able to have a vaccine that can prevent that, that's the part that's um, um, overwhelming. And if we had a vaccine that's effective, that's what we need to, um, to go with. The other thing that's interesting is J&J &J is also testing a two vaccine series and we should have an idea what's going on in May. Okay. Um, so again, we were, it's impossible to compare the three different vaccines because the trials were done completely differently. Pfizer and Moderna were testing for symptomatic disease seven to 14 days after the receipt of the second dose, and J&J &J was studying the efficacy of the single dose 14 to 18 days after the dose. But again, as I said with J&J, &J, it, it was 72% effective approximately at those time points, but two months, the, the efficacy of the J&J &J vaccine doesn't stop at 72. It keeps getting better and better and better. Um, and I think it reaches into the um, mid to high 80s as you get to the end of the second month. So it's really virtually the same as far as efficacy compared to Pfizer and Moderna. Mm -hmm. Also, as I mentioned before, Pfizer and Moderna testing was done prior to the emergence of the variants from the UK, Brazil, and South Africa. South America. South Africa. Okay, um, asymptomatic transmission. Um, so we don't know yet, there's a lot that we don't know yet, but we don't know yet if the vaccines can prevent asymptomatic um, infection because the trials, like I said, they were testing for symptomatic disease, not asymptomatic. And it's also not known if a vaccinated person can transmit the virus if they're infected, but don't show systems, symptoms. We don't know that for sure yet. Tests are ongoing. Um, 
I did read, and probably many of you have heard, there is some data coming out of Israel where 90% of those over 50 in the country are vaccinated and the cases, quote unquote, plummeted. Not only hospitalizations, but overall cases, including asymptomatic infection, which does lead to think, one to think that um, the, the amount of transmission also is plummeting from asymptomatic infection, which is great, but we need to don't know that for sure yet. So that's why it's very important when you're in public, when you're in places where people may not have been vaccinated that we continue to wear, um, wear masks. Um, and, but there was, I'm sure you guys all heard, it's all over the news, the CDC guidelines that fully unvaccinated people can now still get together safely. Nothing's a hundred percent, but as safe as it can be in small groups. So that was really good news for many of us. Next. Side effects. So these vaccines, they're very safe. Um, so, but we probably have heard, or you've probably heard or experienced or seen um, the different side effects. The common side effects are true with all three vaccines and they're very similar, including a really sore arm, um, a headache, muscle aches, nausea, fever. And they're more common after the second dose and a bit more vigorous in younger people. And I read yesterday, a bit more vigorous in some women versus men. We have no idea why, but um, it's just, it's one of those things. But the interesting thing is for people, especially after the second vaccine who have the symptoms, it's uncanny that it's 24 hours. Um, I did have it, um, symptoms after my second vaccine, and I felt pretty lousy for 24 hours. Uh, you know, kind of spent the day watching TV, trying to take a nap, and then the next day I woke up. I thought for sure I was going to still feel lousy, and poof, it was gone. It was just a. Uh, and I've heard that story from many, many of my coworkers and patients. Very much the same things. Also, many, many people have zero side effects, or really just a little bit of soreness in the arm. If you want to see some um, percentages, you can go to the next slide. It's kind of small, I apologize. But so it, it's, um, again, a younger age group and an older age group, some of the typical symptoms and about what percentages of people um, undergo those side effects. So go ahead. Um, so why does this happen? It basically shows that the immune system is mounting response. Um, and that's why, too, people that have had COVID who have had um, the, the vaccine might have some of these um, side effects to the vaccine after the first um, vaccine rather than just the second because their body is already primed with antibodies against COVID. Um, these, ex these effects are to be expected. They are absolutely not dangerous. They're not comfortable, but as we've seen, um, it's 100% um, better to go through something like this than to go through COVID itself, which can be deadly, et cetera. Next. Um, Dr. Alexander was talking about the allergic reactions. They're extraordinarily rare and there are the same, um, uh, the same percentages that she was mentioning, 4.7 cases out of a million in Pfizer and 2.5 for Moderna. Um, and again, pretty much every place that you go to get the vaccine, the places are set up for um, if somebody were to have an allergic reaction, anybody that's had a common, um, had allergies to foods or history of anaphylaxis to anything else, that is not a contraindication, but they do ask you. And so rather than watching you for 15 minutes, they're gonna watch you for the extra 30 minutes to make sure that you're okay. Um, another possible reaction is participants rarely develop Bell's palsy, which is um, a temporary facial nerve palsy. However, this rate wasn't higher than the general population, so it's unclear whether or not the vaccine caused it or whether it was just really a coincidence. Next. Long-term effects. So again, these vaccines, the production is very new. Again, the technology is not. The technology, especially those mRNA vaccines has been on for um, more than 10 years. But these particular vaccines have been in existence for a very short period of time. Um, so ongoing studies are going, but at this time there are no long-term side effects of the vaccine. Um, vaccines in general have short-term side effects like we were talking about, body aches, fever, a sore arm, 
Um, but they are the long-term effects from vaccine presentable diseases like measles or polio are much greater than the brief side effects from the vaccine. We do know that the COVID-19 um, COVID itself can have long-term side effects, fever, fatigue, shortness of breath, prolonged cough, um, joint pain, difficulty with con concentration, depression, and many more. So the disease is worth presenting, preventing by receiving the vaccine. Next. So over the past several months, I've been hearing, ever since the vaccine was first coming out from my patients, number of concerns that they might have, which surprised me. So I wanted to dispel a few of the COVID vaccine myths that I've heard. The first one that I heard about two months ago is that um, a mother and daughter didn't want the daughter to get the vaccine because of the risk of infertility. So that's not true. There's absolutely no evidence and no theoretic reason why a COVID vaccine or any vaccine can affect fertility in men or women. Um, vaccination is the best way of reducing a risk of catching COVID-19 in pregnancy and um, pregnant women are at higher risk for developing severe disease. So if one was considering becoming pregnant to be vaccinated ahead of time would be an excellent idea. Next. Um, can the COVID vaccine give you COVID? Absolutely not. As Dr. Alexander said, basically the mRNA and the Johnson & Johnson uh, DNA vaccines, they produce the protein that mimics the spike in the, um, the virus, but it doesn't make the virus. So it's absolutely impossible to get COVID-19 from the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, it is possible, and this people, we have certainly seen that somebody would get their first or second COVID vaccine and two or three days later come down with COVID. Well, that's not from the vaccine itself. It's because they had been infected ahead of time and just presented with symptoms a couple of days after. And with the high incidence of COVID in our society at this point, that's where they got it, not from the vaccine itself. Um, also, just to kind of reiterate what Dr. Alexander had said, uh, the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines cannot and do not change or interact with your DNA in any way. Next. Sorry, Ugh, technology. technology, okay. So another one that I, I heard of from one of my nurses that I work with is she really didn't wanna get the um, mRNA vaccine because she was concerned about the microchips. And I hadn't really heard of this microchip being inserted into the vaccine, but that's also a myth. Absolutely no vaccines, including vaccine against COVID-19, contain any microchips. I mean, I was reading about it. I think it would be impossible to do. Microchips are far too big and these are tiny, minuscule little particles. Um, and also the government wouldn't allow any such an entity to, in a, to uh, track people. It just was kind of crazy. Um, I, apparently it came from a conspiracy theory that was misconstrued um, in, misconstruing information from the Gates Foundation um, and their investigation of worldwide COVID-19 um, vaccines efforts, vaccination efforts. Next. Okay. So those are some of my myths. I know you guys have lots mm -hmm. of other questions, but some of the things that I came across. Thank you so much. That was so informative um, and so interesting. So what we will do first is let's check uh, the question and answer box um, and then um, we can uh, move to the uh, uh, questions that were answered ahead of time. So the first is um, that uh, I have a script from my mother's geriatrician indicating that uh, I am, it looks like I am her primary caregiver. Does this script allow me to register her for a vaccination as a healthcare worker? So um, I, I think I can take this one. Um, yes, uh, the definition of healthcare worker is not defined by um, a license, right? Anybody that's providing care in the home at this point is eligible for a, a vaccine if you're providing care to a sick, um, person uh, that, that needs help. This includes um, unlicensed home health aides as well. Um, and, and parents of um, children uh, who uh, may be um, disabled or uh, especially medically fragile as well. Okay. Um, and then the second question is, 
what about those who work in Union County or New Jersey, but not 65 yet, but they are over 60? Um, Dr. Shelley, would you be able to answer this one? Um, yes. The categories are if you're between the age of 16 and 64 years of age um, and you have certain health conditions that you're still eligible to receive the vaccine. So if you have certain medical conditions, um, you would then be eligible to receive the vaccine even though you're under the age of 65 years. Thank you. Okay. Um, and where are the mega site email addresses? So I, I can take that one. Um, the, the mega sites don't necessarily have email addresses. Um, depending on what mega site uh, you go to, uh, they are primarily um, hosted um, by um, healthcare centers. So um, the one in Middlesex County, I believe, is uh, maybe hosted by uh, Robert Wood Johnson, maybe. Uh, the one in Morris County is um, sponsored by um, Atlantic um, Health. Um, but what you can do is you can go to the website we referenced at the beginning um, of the seminar, um, which uh, you can just Google COVID-19 um, vaccination, and it will bring you up a list of all the sites that are currently providing vaccine in New Jersey, and uh, they can give you information on, on how to contact those sites. But I don't think there's an actual email address for the mega sites. And the next question is, um, uh, maybe Dr. Alexander, you could take this one. It says, does the Johnson & Johnson vaccine have live virus in it? So no, not at all. Um, I know it, it the, the adenovirus part might sound a little scary, but it's completely inactivated. Like I said, it's not going to cause any illness. It's uh, been modified so that it won't cause illness in your body. And the DNA, codes for the pr spike protein on the coronavirus. So it doesn't make a virus in your body. It just makes that part of the virus that can be recognized by your immune system. So it's not a live virus at all. And it can't, again, can't give you COVID from the vaccine. That's great. Thank you so much. So this can is add one thing to, to the reason that that could be um, important is because many of our vaccines actually are diminished live viruses such as um, the, the old uh, varicella one and rubella, measles, those are live viruses. Um, they can't cause disease, but they're very low grade. But those particular vaccines you would not wanna give during pregnancy. So that's important. Um, right now, we don't know whether the COVID-19 vaccine is okay for somebody that's pregnant, but those tests are going on. And my inkling is that they're going to be able to find that it's fine because as Dr. Alexander said, they don't affect the DNA and they're not live viruses. Um, and we give many other vaccines during pregnancy, such as the Tdap, as well as the influenza vaccine. Thank you, thank you so much. So the next question, Dr. Baker, um, I think um, you can see if, um, is for you. Um, this is actually a really common question that we get. So um, they wanna know, the, the resident wants to know, how long will the vaccine be good for? For example, will it be needed again in the fall or once a year? Or do you think it'll be good for years to come? That's an excellent question. And the answer is we don't know. Um, it's an ongoing studies. I mean, I think we'll have some better idea because the, the studies of the people that were in the trials have been going on and on. And I know they're, they're following their antibody titers. Um, we don't know really at what level does an antibody titer dip to the point that one would be susceptible to disease again. Um, so we don't know that. One part thing that we were reading about with the J&J &J vaccine is because I believe it's the memory T cells, back to Dr. Alexander's uh, immunology lesson, sometimes they can remember certain genetic information for years. So it is possible, even though the initial efficacy is the 72% that people are worried about, this particular vaccine could even theoretically um, co uh, be eff uh, efficacious for even longer. So we don't know. But the bottom line is we don't know. There's going to be studies. I have a feeling there we're going to have to have some sort of a booster specifically because of the different variants that are already in our country. Mm -hmm. And some of those variants, the vaccines are not as efficacious um, as to the run of the real coronavirus. So keep 
asking and reading. And as soon as any of us know, we'll let you know. Thank you. Yes, uh, that's true. Um, you know, we, uh, it, it's amazing to think that um, we just passed the one year anniversary, right? In some ways, it seems like we've been living this life for, for many, many years, but really um, COVID is, is just a year uh, new to us. So um, that's definitely an appreciated answer. Um, then the next question uh, talks about what if you work uh, in Union County? I think this is related to the county vaccination site. Um, the Union County vaccination site uh, will accept individuals who live or work in Union County. So if you work in Union County, uh, you should be able to register with the county vaccination site. Um, then the next question um, I will throw out for whoever uh, would like to answer. It says, if the vaccine only prevents one from getting sick, then how will this be the solution to the pandemic? We have been told for months that asymptomatic people can still spread the virus. I guess I could try. Um, so basically vaccination, we're hoping that it's going to be able to decrease not only symptomatic um, COVID, COVID infections, but asymptomatic ones. And by decreasing the amount of overall infections, that's how we're going to get ahead of this virus. Um, as we've been reading, it, it's going to take 85% of the population to not have enough people in our population to be able to have the virus to spread to. Um, and until we get to that number, the virus will continue to spread, be, be it asymptomatically or symptomatically. Hopefully with the vaccines, it's going to decrease the amount of both asymptomatic and symptomatic. So therefore we can reach that 85% and COVID will have nowhere to go and we will be, we'll never be quite back to normal, but closer back to normal than we are now. I think the hope is also that we prevent serious illness and death um, really right now um, until we get more information on the spread of like the asymptomatic spread with the vaccine. And these vaccines are really good at doing that. Cause if you, you know, we, the common cold is everywhere. We don't vaccinate against that because you don't, not a lot of people pass away and it's not serious. So if we can at least for now get it to the point where we're not having people, as many people dying as not serious death, I think that's even a little bit of a benefit from these vaccines, at least in the meantime, until we figure out the longer term goal. And, and my understanding is it is quite possible that it does prevent people from actually um, becoming infected with the virus, even asymptomatically. We're just not right. sure at this point, correct? Right. Exactly. Correct. Yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. Next question, uh, I, the, 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 uh, the, the person says, I am not 65 plus, but I'm working as a dental assistant. Will this allow me to receive the vaccine? Dr. Rizzolo, do you wanna answer this? I can answer that. So yes, uh, dental assistants um, are eligible to receive the vaccine. Um, they're part and they fall under the umbrella of the healthcare provider. And, um, you know, at, at, at some point, or it was thought that, you know, it would certainly be advisable due to the nature of your job being closer to the exc excretions um, and oral um, virus. So yes, you would be eligible and we would recommend it as a group. Okay, thank you so much. And the next question is, are any of the vaccines less effective to people with compromised immune systems? So I don't, I, again, I don't think we have long-term data for this, but it's 100% recommended to get it for compromised immune systems because those people, if you do get sick, will have more severe illness. Um, I guess anybody can correct me if I'm wrong. I guess in theory, yes, you could probably have less of an immune response to the vaccine just because you don't have as robust of an immune system. Um, but even that little bit, even if you do make a little bit of antibodies and keep you out of the hospital or keep you from getting severe illness uh, would be enough, I think. And they are safe for people with immuno, in immunocompromised states. And Dr. Alexander, to add to that, one of the questions that we commonly get at the health department is, uh, what is the best vaccine residents should get? Anyone you can get in your arm, really, whatever you can get. They're all, like Dr. Baker mentioned, they're all extremely effective, extremely. And like I was mentioning, they have, I think some of them have like, up to a 90 plus, 99%, 95% effective at keeping you from dying um, and 80 plus 85 plus percent from preventing serious illness, all of them, all three. So anyone you can get, and it's already hard for people to get one of them. So whatever you can get in your arm, I think yeah. is, 
is the best vaccine to get. I wouldn't wait for one mm -hmm. or the other. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's exactly right. So if you can find an appointment, whatever vaccine is being offered, uh, they are also comparable that, that you should take mm -hmm. that appointment for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for that answer. Okay. So the next question is today New York announced that they would uh, lower the starting age to 60 uh, from down to 60 from 65 without a comorbidity. Can we expect New Jersey to do likewise? It seems less chaotic than suddenly saying, okay, for everyone under 65. Um, so I can take this one. Um, we have not heard anything from the State Department of Health that um, they um, are considering that, um, but that doesn't mean that um, you know uh, the guidelines can't change uh, in the near future. Uh, one of the things about everything that we're saying tonight, and really um, we have uh, always start with this disclaimer for the last disclaimer for the last year, is that guidance has changed so quickly. Um, so something that we're saying today, like who qualifies for the vaccine may not be true in the next few days, right? So you definitely want to, especially with the vaccine and eligibility, re, uh, be up to date, uh, make sure that uh, you're really following who's eligible because that can change quickly. Uh, this question is, we see, uh, will we see vaccines for children uh, under age, uh, teenagers, children anytime soon? And this uh, person says, thank you very much for this webinar. Well, you're welcome. Um, and uh, what about Dr. Baker? What do you think? Do you think that we'll see uh, the, the vaccine being offered for children? I certainly hope so. I know that there are studies that are ongoing at this point for all of the different vaccines. Um, they've lowered, I, I'm sure from 12 to 16, there's ongoing studies and that's probably close. And pretty soon they're going to be lowering the age for the vaccine trials. So as soon as they have enough information to show that these vaccines are safe and effective for children as well, believe me, they're gonna be out there. So I have a follow-up question to that. Um, some of the comments that, that we get at the health department is uh, the, the virus, uh, when children contract it, um, it's safe and, and kids don't really get sick. Um, so uh, it's really a two-part question. Um, you know, in, in your clinical experience, um, Dr. Rizzolo, Dr. Baker, Dr. Alexandra, uh, do, do you think that it's a it's a fair statement that kids don't get sick when they get um, COVID nineteen, and um, do you and do you think that if the vaccine is um, available in the near future, that parents should consider it for their children? A hundred percent, yes. Um, so children, yes, that's true. They they do not get as sick as older people. There are not as many that are hospitalized. But interestingly, when they do get sick, they have some. Um, really unusual conditions that can also be very serious. Um, and young children as young as two have, have died yes. Um, yes. from COVID. So again, not at the same rate, not at the same numbers as adults, but children can get very sick and can die. And it's very indiscriminate. You never know a perfectly healthy soccer player would get very sick and, and could die. So um, yes, when, and the second question is once the vaccine is available, of course the parents should be getting the uh, vaccine for the children, not only to protect their child because they don't want their child to be one of the um, children that gets very sick, but it also, that will help to spread, um, spread disease. Because remember I was saying we need to get to 85% and if 25% of our population is children, we can't get to 85% until some of the children are starting to be vaccinated. We need them to be part of the solution. So. Yes, um, I'm hoping that they're going to be finding that the uh, vaccines are safe and effective for children very soon because they're part of, um, part of the solution. Great, thank you so much for that. Uh, the next question is, if a person has high blood pressure and high cholesterol, are they currently eligible to get the vaccine? Um, so Dr. Shelley, do you wanna answer that one? Yes, they are. Um, the state health department designated a list of, of medical conditions and they've recently added on additional medical conditions. And one of those conditions is hypertension. Thank you so much. Um, and the next question is, what about uh, the multi-system disease? I think they mean MISTI for children. Can uh, Dr. Alexandra, do you wanna talk sure. about that for a second? Yes, yeah, so, so that's, what we've been seeing a lot in the younger population. Um, it presents like something called Kawasaki disease um, or toxic shock syndrome, basically swollen lips, swollen hands. And what happens is the organs one by one kind of shut down. Um, so I've had children on dialysis, um, ECMO, which is 
to help their hearts pump, um, been in the ICU. So um, like Dr. Baker was saying, when kids do get sick, they, they get sick, they get very sick um, sometimes, not all of them. And like, like we said, a lot less than the adults, but that is the big concern that uh, multi-system uh, disease uh, for kids. And it's just basically inflammation and uh, throughout the whole body. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, and then some, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the next question is, is it better to sign up at the New Jersey vaccine scheduling system or through the individual sites you mentioned or both? Dr. Shelley, do you wanna answer this one? Uh, both. <laughs> You want to you want to sign up at as many sites as you possibly can, so that it gives you the best opportunity to get the vaccine as soon as your name comes up. Thank you so much for that. Okay. Um, we have another question: What is the anticipated time frame for the majority of people to get vaccinated in New Jersey? So I can answer this. Um, this is something that really depends on the amount of vaccine production um, that we see. Um, the White House has said that they hope that the majority of Americans will be able to receive a vaccine by May. And if that um, is to happen, uh, that would be wonderful, but it really is dependent on how much vaccine is produced and shipped uh, directly to New Jersey. Um, so we unfortunately do not have um, a real concrete answer at this time. Um, anybody else has, have anything to add to that? Okay. I wish we knew. <laughs> no, Megan, I think it's important to remember, and I think everyone's going to agree. I mean, there was so much concern about the vaccine being produced so quickly and how we, you know, process it so quickly. But I think you, that the audience needs to remember that we have modern technology now that allowed us to facilitate the development of this vaccine, whereas years ago, we were doing it on Petri dishes and slowly growing the viruses. And, and now we're doing it through simulated technology. So we know, you know, we know the mutations that can occur. We know that it's safe and it's to be expected that it, we would be able to produce it at a, a much quicker rate than we would 10, you know, 20 years ago. So, you know, the safety data is real and, and we probably feel pretty confident that it is a safe vaccine. Thank you so much for that point. And um, isn't it also true that a lot of the work with the technology for the MRA vaccines was already done before COVID? Um, so, so we really had the framework in place, which is another reason why we were able to produce a vaccine quickly. Is that is that fair to say? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. Um, and then some other questions that came in that were emailed that I thought were good. Um, so um, for um, any of the panelists, uh, uh, if I already had COVID, do I really need a COVID vaccine? So everybody's nodding yes, their yes, head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the well, answer is absolutely, absolutely yes, yes, for some of the reasons that we kind of mentioned. Um, yes, somebody who has had COVID will have produced their own natural antibodies, but we don't know how long those antibodies are protecting for. Um, one test, one question that we had talked about before is whether or not antibody testing would be helpful for that. Um, and the answer is no, because the antibody tests are all a little bit different and they measure they don't always measure exactly um, how much protection they're given. Most of the antibody tests we have are, yes, you have antibodies, no, you don't have antibodies, so. Okay, that's great to know. Um, one of the other questions that came in that we commonly receive here is, uh, if I did have COVID in the past, when should I get vaccinated? So this was also, when it, the vaccine first came out, the recommendation was to wait 90 days after having been diagnosed with COVID. The reason for that is because, partly because of the scarcity of the COVID vaccine. And one was um, imagining that the antibodies, the natural antibodies following a COVID infection were to be protecting the patient, the person, for at least 90 days. So they didn't have to worry so much at that point of, of getting a second infection. Um, so therefore, more vaccine would be available to people that had not had an infection yet. However, the 90 days is not a firm and fast number. Um, one can have the vaccine soon after they've become completely asymptomatic. We had a case um, today, and we're really recommending 
waiting at least 30 days, but you do not have to wait the entire 90 days. So I would think if the, in, in, as soon as the vaccine becomes more readily available, as soon as the person is asymptomatic for 15 to 30 days to get that vaccine in place as soon as possible. Great, that is, um, that is really good to know because I know that the guidance can certainly be um, confusing. Um, one of the other common questions uh, that uh, came in, uh, maybe Dr. Rizzolo, you can take this one. Um, do you think doctors' offices will eventually carry the COVID vaccine? And, um, you know. Yep, I, I do. I think once um, we increase the supply, um, we'll be able to carry it in all of our doctors' office. And part of the, the, the initial hesitancy was um, the vaccines needed to be frozen and not every office had the equipment to freeze the vaccines, only some of our bigger major medical centers. And this was more so with the Pfizer vaccine. Um, but as I'm aware, the Johnson & Johnson can pretty much be stored under usual vaccine, vaccine conditions. So I think you'll see more and more doctor's offices have them. Great, thank you, that, that's a great answer. Um, another question that was emailed that comes up a lot. Um, so we hear a lot about the masking guidance and a lot about double masking. Uh, if I'm fully vaccinated, do I, should I still be double masking if I'm fully vaccinated? So the answer would be yes, for the same, the reason that I had mentioned before. The reason that somebody would be wearing a mask after being vaccinated isn't to protect themselves because in theory, they're 95% safe, shouldn't be able to get um, serious illness at all. But the reason one is wearing a mask because we don't know whether the person who's vaccinated would be able to carry the virus asymptomatically and spread it to somebody who does not um, is not immune or does not have the vaccine. So as far as single or double masking, the recommendations would really hadn't changed because this, the double masks, it protects oneself better than the single mask, but it also is going to protect other people. So until at this time, I would still recommend using um, when out in public, when around other people, anybody that could be susceptible um, to please continue to wear the two masks. Thank you. That, that's really helpful and that really helps clarify it. Um, the next question submitted just now is, um, how long can it take to receive an answer after I sign up? I signed up a month ago. Um, Dr. Shelley, can you answer that one? Um, I can't really give you an accurate answer. I can just tell you that um, it depends upon how many people that, that are ahead of you in the queue. Um, once they get to your name, then they'll reach out to you um, and try and schedule an appointment for you. Right. Um, and, and Dr. Shelley, if people register, uh, if residents register uh, at different sites, um, let's say you know, you're know you registered at Foresight and you finally get an appointment, um, what should they do if they have multiple, if they're on multiple waiting lists uh, or if they have multiple appointments? When they get the appointment at the site that they plan on going to, they should cancel the appointments at the other sites that they have been scheduled so that that will open up an opportunity for someone else. Great. Okay. Thank you. That, that is good to know. Um, the next question is, why is there a risk of getting antibody-dependent enhancement with the mRNA vaccines, and what does that mean to the body? I don't understand that question. Um, I don't think I've ever heard of that. Yeah, I don't know okay. either. Um, uh, if you'd like to clarify, um, you can certainly type in a second question. Um, after the second vaccine, can you travel and come back without quarantine? Um, so I can answer this. Uh, this is a really, really common question that we get at the health department. Um, and unfortunately, right now, the travel guidance in New Jersey and um, from the CDC is that even after two vaccinations, once you travel outside the immediate tri-state area, you are expected uh, to quarantine upon return. Uh, not only quarantine upon return, but uh, you are expected to um, test uh, day three to five after you return. And then uh, if you test negative, uh, you're expected to stay home and quarantine for the next uh, four, seven days after return. So unfortunately, um, you know, and, and, and sometimes, um, you know, residents, uh, um, you know, say that, that that doesn't seem very clear, right? I'm fully vaccinated and I, I completely um, understand how it's confusing. It's confusing even for us who, who we do this day in and day out. But the one thing uh, right now where we're at is CDC is really not, um, we're still advising against non-essential travel. 
So it's still really important to remember that uh, the, the CDC guidance at this time is travel really should be avoided if it can. Uh, the next question is, Will the coronavirus become a recurring annual phenomenon requiring uh, vaccinations like the flu virus? Um, I think we answered this previously and we said, but we're just not sure, right? Would, I mean, you know, um, I, I would say that uh, we really um, are, are still gathering that information. Okay. And one last question. Uh, if a person has trimenial neuralgia and a history of anaphylactic uh, allergic reactions, uh, even on a skin allergy test, is it safe to get the COVID-19 vaccine? So it depends on what the allergy is too. Um, but I mentioned before, it's really only things that are in the vaccine, which is not a lot of stuff. It's mRNA, the lipid layer, um, and some you know, other electrolytes basically. Um, so I would ask your doctor and just clarify what you, your allergy is, but trigeminal neuralgia, no contraindications, you absolutely get it. Um, but again, it just depends on what you're allergic to, but most things, allergies, you should be fine to get the vaccine, but clarify with your doctor just what your specific allergy is, how they can look at what's in the vaccine, but for the most part, should be okay. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a great point. Uh, one of the things that we always say uh, in the health department is we give guidance, right? Uh, so certainly we're giving informative information, but certainly for specific uh, medical information for individual people, uh, you should always reach out to your healthcare provider who knows your medical history best and can advise you based on your medical history. Um, the last question uh, is uh, the CDC states if you are vaccinated, you can meet with others who are vaccinated in small groups. Uh, so this came out yesterday. Uh, this was um, really uh, rewarding news uh, for all of us who miss our families uh, and friends. Uh, it says you can meet with those who are low risk uh, and healthy. Uh, this individual went to the CDC website to define who would they, they would consider low risk and healthy, and the CDC did not define that. So they are asking, um, you know, what would be the definition uh, of, of a low risk individual? I would probably say um, any of the people ages 16 to, to um, 65, there are a number of medical conditions that would qualify somebody for getting the vaccine. And if they didn't have any of those particular conditions, um, probably being immunocompromised would be one of them too. I would say people that are perfectly healthy would be low risk. People that have um, at-risk conditions such as high blood pressure, um, obesity, diabetes, those would be higher risk people and probably would not be as safe to be around at this point. Right. That, that, that is a great answer. Um, thank you so much. Um, and then one final question. Um, uh, so this, this question is, um, if the MRA, mNRA uh, vaccine uh, technology has been in existence for about 10 years, why have, uh, why, have, why have there not been other vaccines that have utilized the technology before this one? Any thoughts? I mean, I think that, that every virus is different and this is the virus that's responding to this type of, of makeup. And it goes back to what Dr. Alexander was saying of, of how you know, the pathophysiology behind the virus, the pathophysiology behind the vaccine. Uh, and I think that if it was needed in the past and it was gonna be effective against another virus, we would have used it, but it just so happens that this is the virus where the messenger RNA is working the best. Thank you so also, much. what she had mentioned, it's actually so interesting that there are other vaccines in development now um, mm -hmm. uh, that should be coming out shortly that are gonna be helping with another, a number of other really terrible diseases. So it's pretty interesting. Great. Yeah, that's great. Really, really great. Um, there are no more questions remaining and we answered all the questions that had came in ahead of time. So um, I wanna thank all the participants um, that uh, all the residents that were able to join us virtually and certainly uh, the panelists. Uh, this was a really, really great informative evening. So thank you so much for giving us an hour uh, of your time. And uh, you know, I, I think this is uh, great for, um, for everybody who attended. Um, so thank you all so much. I hope everybody found this um, helpful and uh, we'll look forward to messaging more updates to you in the future.
Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Bye. you. Okay, good night, everybody. Thank you. Good, good night. night.